So Bruce Denner, who is our cer ceramics um, studio head, has been with Peters Valley for 20 years, and uh, he received his MFA from Alfred University, and he's taught at universities all over the United States and New Zealand and Malaysia. His work can be found in national and international collections. Um, Bruce doesn't stand still for very long. He has done numerous residencies including and workshops, including in Japan and China and India and in all over the United States. He's a member of the International Academy of Ceramics and um, an author. He has written quite a bit, and in particular, his best-selling book that he co-authored with Simon Leach, A Pottery Handbook. Um, and, you know, he has also been an incredible mentor for many of our students that have come over the years and also for our studio assistants. He's, you know, really built up a program that's nationally renowned, internationally renowned. And every year when we have applications for the studio assistantship, we get a hundred envelopes that he's got to go through an application. So anyway, welcome Bruce. I'm so happy that you're going to give us a talk about what you're up to now. Oh, thank you, Kristen. And uh, can you hear me everybody? Hopefully. Uh, and uh, can you see it? Okay. Yeah. I'll take that as a yes. So yeah. <laughs> um, thank you, Lakota, for your technological prowess, your, your help with all of this. And thanks, Kristen, for the, the introduction. Um, what I'm going to show you tonight are a, a samples of my most recent work. And I have about 25 images of these architectural vessels or bowls, whatever one might want to call them, um, that, uh, that I have been making. And, um, and so uh, I have kind of generally three influences, or one might call them inspirations, that I work with with these pieces. Um, and the first one is uh, geography and geology. And I tend to um, respond to either places like this, which is uh, near my hometown. So my hometown of Lander, Wyoming, would be in the center of that photograph at the horizon point. So that's about 20 miles away. This is called Red Canyon. And uh, my hometown is at the bottom of the Wind River Range. And the Wind River Range is interesting because they're the tallest mountains in Wyoming. And um, because they are that, that you pass through as you go to higher elevation, you pass through a number of geological formations. So, so you start off with limestone down in the lower reaches and uh, you can even come through some volcanic or igneous rocks, and then the higher elevations are all granite. So because those are three different geological types, you have this very dynamic, um, uh, very dynamic weathering or eroding, and, and erosion happens in different sorts of ways depending on what kind of rock you have. The other thing that's interesting about it uh, for me as an artist is that you have these interfaces between the different uh, formations. So my work, um, I try to get some sense of, of where I grew up in terms of the, uh, the geology into the work. My second influence is my father's architecture. Um, and uh, he's probably uh, he's probably the strongest influence in the work that you're going to see. Um, for years, I've been making sculpture at, that references his architecture, not in any kind of literal way. I'm not interested in the literal, but in more abstracted sorts of ways. Um, but the challenge has been for a very long time for me as to how do I get uh, a sense of his architecture and his love for form, his love for the coincidence of form, his love for confluences, just like you have with those geological features coming together. Um, how do you get that into a smaller scale and into a, into a format that it references a functional pot, you know, a, a, a bowl in the situation that you're going to see. So I love his sense of color. Um, this is the arena at University of Wyoming. It's uh, not just a basketball arena. It also features rock and jazz concerts and uh, volleyball and other sporting events, but it's just an exquisite space. And 
One of the, probably the most important thing about that space beyond the architecture for me is when attending events in that, in that building, um, the sound in there is just uh, fantastic and it heightens the emotions that are there. You know, it's just very intense uh, space to, to view some kind of, kind of a, um, an event. So I take that away from the buildings as well as I take their architecture. You know, I think about the audio aspect of, of his work and, and so forth. So he paid a lot of attention to that. Um, and, uh, and then my, my sculpture. So this is kind of a recent uh, piece, just about two years old. This is a um, terracotta piece that's about four feet long from tip of the tail to the tip of the beak, uh, about three feet tall. And it's made out of terracotta, fired to about 1900 degrees. It's based on a bird that's indigenous to Wyoming called a magpie. Um, I love that bird. It's got tremendous character. It probably, probably taps into the human character more than any other bird other than the, the talkers like the parrots and the parakeets and so forth. So fantastic, fantastic animal. And, um, and so you can see on the construction of that, that I am referencing some of the same elements of my father's architecture where you have these walls coming into each other and so forth. And on the sculptures, I start building from the very interior of them and then work to the uh, exterior. So what you're gonna see are some bowls. Um, this is actually a cup uh, using some of the, that very front motif there is based off of a solar building that he designed um, uh, the roof line that supports the, the solar panels. And then also some of that Wyoming uh, geology. This piece here is um, fired multiple times. It's fired in an onagama kiln. And then uh, afterwards I fire to cone six oxidation. Most of my wood fired work is multiple fired. So um, my wife, Covinda, is a, is a painter and she's just uh, this fantastic painter who just uses color like nobody's business. And so I've really learned a lot about color from, from Covinda. Um, this piece here I, I built in Michigan last year. So one of the things about, uh, uh, about this series of works is that I want to try to think of these pieces as visual diaries or three-dimensional diaries. And so part of that for me is to try to record aspects in the work itself of where I'm making the piece. So that later when I see the piece, I may have these memories that I tap into and so forth. So this piece was built right on the shores of, of Lake Michigan. The other thing is, is that I'm very interested in building the pieces using local materials. So when I travel, um, I, I work with the local clay and so forth and fire in generally in wood kilns, but uh, other kilns as well. But I want the work to have some sense of that materiality. And I think for my father's architecture, one of the things I've always loved about his architecture is that he pays huge attention to material. That's as important to him as form is. And uh, so I've kind of taken that as a, as a uh, kind of a, an influence or an inspiration that way. So these pieces were built out of clay that is out in Mendocino, California. So this is Northern California um, stoneware, uh, fired at Nick Schwartz's on a gamma. Uh, this, is a, this is also a piece from there. So you can see, that there might be some similarities in forms and so forth, but uh, when you're using different clay bodies, for those of you who aren't ceramics, when you're using different clay bodies and, and putting them into uh, these wood kilns, the atmosphere inside the kilns really has a lot to say about the aesthetics of it. So I can, I can depend on um, not repeating literally, but I can depend upon using somewhat similar touchstones in my work and have them read very, very differently according to the wood that's being used as well as the, the clay itself. Um, this body of work that you're seeing is in a show in Saratoga Springs, New York at the Saratoga Clay Art Center. This is a, this is a piece that I, I uh, built in India this past year uh, using uh, clay that's, um, that is uh, prospected not too far from Pondicherry, India, which is down on the southeastern coast on the Indian Ocean. 
Um, and the wood ash, which you see is a yellowish kind of tone on those upper edges, um, is a very common wood that's, that's uh, used for cooking and, and so forth there in the South Indian area. This piece was right here in Peters Valley. So um, this is a, a kind of a light stoneware. And like I was saying before, I do second or third fire these. So that black motif in the background with the blue dots on it was added later and fired in an electric kiln. Um, this piece here is call, I call riverbed and uh, also a, a New Jersey clay bodies um, and some, some local stuff thrown in as a mixture. But one of the things about my dad's architecture that I'm super aware of when I'm building is how do you, how, uh, an architect generally has to use forms on the interior that then uh, go to the exterior of a building and they do that for functional reasons, for example, um, for buttressing at a, a, of a cathedral or the buttressing of that basketball arena. Now, s s the buttressing on his basketball arena, that's an earth shelter building, actually. He was, he was a practitioner of earth shelter. And so that's a huge earth shelter project. So the buttressing um, plays out a little bit differently with an earth shelter type of building. But um, so I'm really interested in how those, those forms on the inside might uh, take a viewer uh, to the exterior and, and surprise them. I try to mix things up so it doesn't necessarily make the same sense as an architectural uh, building does. Uh, this is called ledge or shift. This one is called shift. So the floor of this one uh, it continues out beyond the piece and the vessel itself happens within, the, within that floor. So a little bit of a change up. This piece I made in Sasayama, Japan. And uh, with that and the Indian uh, pieces, I'm playing around with that, the two-dimensional shape on the exterior of them to maybe mix up our perception of what is there if we're looking at the pieces from a distance, um, making people think about the perspective on them and something surprising. Uh, the glaze on the inside of this look in the shot down below where you're looking in, that's a cone six glaze. Uh, it's a lime green. Kind of glaze. So I like to I like to use kind of surprising colors that you might not see in wood firing and and put them in there later after the wood firing to be a little bit of a surprise. This one's called Cirque. It refers to an area above my hometown called Cirque of the Towers. This is uh, this piece is called Gable, and uh, the the next few pieces were fired in not wood but in electric in an electric kiln. And with these pieces, I'm using glaze um, that's all over the piece. I'm spraying it on, but I'm, uh, it's not just one glaze. It's about five or six variations on the same glaze. So it creates shifts, but at the same time, it creates kind of a monolithic feel aesthetically. Um, so that hopefully, what I hope a viewer senses with this body of work as opposed to the wood-fired pieces is a, um, uh, more of a concentration on just the form because wood fire kind of it, it emphasizes aspects of the form and diminishes aspects. So with these pieces, I'm really kind of interested in in um, creating more of a an overall sense of form and and so forth, or more of a focus, not an overall sense of form, but a, more of a focus on on form. And uh, I think that this is, this is called ledge. And this one, I'm abstracting a, a person on a diving board diving into a pool. So I think of my work as larger spaces, uh, but having to capture a sense of that larger space, i.e. a building, a basketball arena, um, in a smaller context, which is an interesting challenge. And that was it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bruce. That was great. Um, and when I first saw these pieces, I thought, boy, I'd really love for them to be buildings that I could walk into. So thank you for that. Um, next, we have Mitzi Campbell. Mitzi um, has been a master level educator for more than 30 years. Her creative focus is fine art photography with an emphasis on botanical life. She's also a writer. Um, her work has been featured in numerous regional and national shows and publications. It's held in many private collections. She regularly leads classes and workshops in the arts. 
She's curated many events and exhibits, published books, magazines, both for herself and for professional and educational institutions, and participated in the leadership and faculty of various academic and arts organizations over three decades. Mitzi also served on the board of Peters Valley for over a decade. And um, in the time I have known her, she is just incredibly creative and motivated to try new things and to explore her best self and most creative self. And also she brings a delicate touch to everything she does. And makes it beautiful, including our campus. So welcome, Mitzi. Thank you so much. Um, I just have to say, first of all, thank you for giving me this opportunity to interact with all of you wonderful people that are out there watching. It's the most people I've been with since March. <laughs> so I love that. Um, so I just thought that I would just do a little presentation on um, what uh, I've got going in the Making Matters exhibit, which is my flower photography. And I thought maybe I'd just share with you all some of my secrets so that you can uh, know my a little bit about my process and uh, how I like to work with my flowers. Um, I just, I didn't know that Kristen was gonna give me such a wonderful glowing bio. So I put a little bio in here that I really think of myself as always evolving. Um, I'm a teacher, I'm always a student. I'm a photographer, a writer, and a mother of some grownups. Um, and I just love using photography as a lens into life. And I kind of work with the idea that everything is imperfect, impermanent, and incomplete. And I love looking at those aspects, particularly in botanical subjects. Um, and I believe that we're the creators of our lives and our consciousness is the cause and we are the effect. So I like to involve myself with beauty and see beauty and then um, you know, try to embody that in my life. Uh, so in terms of flowers and photography, I think that, um, you know, that it's pretty common to be interested in flowers. They're beautiful. They know how to draw us in with their beauty. And that's for a good reason, um, because they make us feel good. And I, uh, I think that flowers represent the essence of growth. They're very metaphorical. Um, and the beauty of, of what a living thing can become um, in, in a blossom and whatnot. So I'm gonna share with you these secrets for getting great shots of flowers. Uh, my first secret is that you have to cultivate your inspiration. Um, and so I find that when I get my best shots, my best photography always comes from a time when I'm feeling the most inner directed. I'm feeling good and I sort of get into the moment I think if you're not feeling it, then your images are going to reflect that. And if you look back at some of your photos, even just your photos of your family or yourself or whatnot, you, you'll probably find that's true, that your best photos are the ones where you're feeling inspired, you're feeling good. Um, the second thing to uh, having good photography is to focus on your light. This is all just my opinion, your light and your camera. Um, I always shoot my flowers. I shouldn't say always. I don't like to say always, I don't like to say always but 99% of the time I shoot my flowers in natural light. Um, sometimes I will work with them outdoors and sometimes I'll bring them indoors. And even if I have them indoors, I usually um, like to place them in front of a window to work with sunlight or natural lighting in some way. For me, and this is just my personal preference, I always feel like things that are lit with studio lighting look like they're lit with studio lighting. And for flowers, I just like them to look um, natural. I like them to be, um, to be looking like they would look sort of in the wild, not necessarily um, just a sterile image, but something that looks more alive to me. So that's one of the things that I like to do to make them, um, embody that beauty that I'm always looking for. I do think that your um, equipment makes a difference and I'm gonna talk a little bit about the camera and equipment that I use a little bit later. The setup is also um, sort of important but not important because you do not need to have a fancy setup to get a good picture. And I'm gonna show you a setup of how I took my pictures for the images that are in the Making Matters exhibit and for another one that came out, I think pretty sweet too. Uh, you can cobble together things from your house to set up a great way of showcasing 
whatever it is you want to photograph in this case flowers um, so these are some images that I've taken of flowers outdoors um, going a little deeper into the idea of inspiration in my experience um, you should do a shoot when you're feeling that high creative energy if you're not feeling it if you're tired if you lose your mojo you should just take a break or stop and um, don't force it because you're probably not going to like the outcome. I feel like when I get depleted of energy, if I just take a break or if I stop, then I can come back to it when I'm feeling better and I always get great shots that way. Um, the other part of inspiration is that flowers, I find them very inspiring, but it's not just me. Um, they are actually do cause happiness. Having flowers around you is connected to those neurochemicals that cause happiness. And I have info on that if anybody's interested in further research, but that's actually true. So flowers in themselves are inspiring as subjects. Um, and I find that, you know, having the subject matter that causes inspiration helps to get you into that flow state where you're shooting your pictures, you forget where you are, you forget how much time you've been doing it, and you're just working. It allows you to go deeper. It allows you to discover little subtle nuances within your subject, and flowers are, are, are ripe for that, discovering all kinds of little cool little things that are inside the flowers. There is a lot to see inside of a flower. Uh, this one on the left is one of the flowers that I have um, that I used for the images that are in the show right now at Peters Valley. And this was actually uh, just, it was a COVID shoot. I was feeling cooped up and I, I got some flowers because they made me feel happy when I, I bought these flowers at the grocery store and I thought, all right, great, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take some pictures of my flowers now. So um, I, I just, set this one up in front of a window and I'm going to show you my my setup that I used and I it ended up that I got some some great images from this shoot. I think that um, another interesting thing about flowers is that when you set them up in the light you might notice things about them that you wouldn't have noticed um, otherwise and in in this case for the second image here I I shot these sort of late in life in their lives and they had some discoloration. They started to sort of age a bit. And, and I think that could be very beautiful when you notice those things. And, you know, as I'm looking through the lens at the flower, I noticed this, this leaf is yellow and I might move down slightly to, to focus on the area like that, um, getting some of that imperfection. And, um, you know, I find that very beautiful. So here's my funky setup, uh, my janky little setup. Uh, I just used a stool from my house. I stuck my ranunculus flower in a little bottle of water. Um, I find that if you're shooting flowers indoors or if you cut the flowers to shoot them outdoors, you, they do wilt. So if you're gonna be working with it for any amount of time, you should put it in some water. Um, if I'm just doing a quick shoot and I, I might use a little clip of some sort to, to, to um, put it in my scene. Um, I have a little gorilla tripod. I'm not even using a full tripod in this shoot. I have this little gorilla pod. I'd, sometimes I like to work with that because you can just move it around uh, really easily. I'm sitting on the floor um, and I, I set some black velvet behind my subject and it's, it's all set up on a box. It's just a crazy little janky setup, which anybody could do. If I'm outside, I might use a, a, a full-size tripod. I might sit in a chair. I might um, use, I, another trick that I, I use a lot is if I'm trying to block out some wind, I might use a, a plastic dome, like a plant dome, to put over top of my flower so it's not blowing around. Um, and I've tried all kinds of things. You can, you can experiment. I've tried light backgrounds, dark backgrounds, different types of fabric. I've tried paper. Um, and then uh, also, there are times when I will um, just use the natural background. So like the, the images that were in the previous slide were taken in, in the wild. So there's a, a lot of green in the background. And you can adjust your camera settings, for my photographers out there will know, um, to, to mute your background a little bit or to make the background look more blurry. Um, in this setup, I am using um, a Canon 6D 
and I am using a 100 millimeter macro lens. If you want to get close up shots like the one that's behind me here in my background and some of the, the, the shots that I've actually all of the shots that I've shown, you do have to use a special lens. Um, for getting my flowers to look pretty sharp, um, I do like to take them looking sharp and I use um, a, an aperture setting of about 11 or even uh, going up much higher than, than that to like a 22. And if I want them blurry, I'll, I'll, um, I'll use a lower setting. Or... So I do like to have this kind of sharper look. So I've been uh, kind of working with them in that way for a while. I think they look pretty cool like that. And this guy, actually, if I go back here, that one on the right is a Gerber daisy. And this is one of the shots I got from that shoot. Um, so you can really get something that looks pretty nice from just, you know, setting up something and cobbling it together in your house. I love that about photography. It's kind of tricky that way. It's like, it can fool you. Um, some pro tips. In this shot, I love the look of the light on the one side, the shadow on the other side. Um, and in this one, I have a black and white version in the exhibit um, at Peters Valley. This is an example of one that is sort of coming to the end of its life. And I think that that can um, be a really beautiful sort of um, gives it a little whimsy. Um, and this is where I really find that beauty in the imperfection. I like isolating my subjects. Um, as I said, I think it could really, it adds to the way that it makes the, the beauty of the flower pop. You can see all those little nuances, all the little lines, controlling um, the, the movement of your flower or your plant can be important if you're working outdoors. Um, definitely need the right lens or uh, it, for what you're trying to accomplish with your uh, photography and Working with your editing, um, some of the things that I like to do um, with my editing is work a little bit on um, sharpening certain areas if I want to, to make lines or if I want to, to see uh, little curls or ripples, I might go in and sharpen some of those areas. Sometimes I like to work with contrast, um, making the texture or certain colors kind of pop, but most of, mostly I like to keep it kind of as natural as possible. Uh, why black and white? So the, the images I have in the Making Matters exhibit are both black and white flowers. And sometimes I, I like to take my flowers and put them into black and white because everybody knows the flowers have color. But when we show them in black and white, it can really showcase some of those qualities that you might overlook if you were distracted by the color. So I like to sort of force the viewer to pay attention to the shape, the form, um, beyond what we're normally attracted to about a flower. So it, it gives you a sense of drama. It gives you a sense of just kind of taking it to its most basic but most stark um, beauty. Um, and um, this guy is in the show. It's in the form of a square. Um, and I have, in this case, um, printed it on a card, but uh, sometimes I work with printing things on in other materials. And if anybody has any questions about things I like to use, materials I like to use for printing or process, I'm happy to answer any of those questions since I'm not going to be able to teach this um, summer. If anybody really wants to know something, if you're looking forward to learning something, just shoot me a, a, an email or send me a text or uh, get in touch. So here are some of the ways you can get in touch with me. If you want a copy of this presentation too, I can um, also leave that with Lakota and I'm happy to share this as a PDF for anybody who's interested. So that's, a, that's about it. Thank you, Mitzi. Thank you. You're so welcome. Okay, You're next welcome. we've got Steve Cook. Okay. There we go. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I think I got muted. I was introducing you. Oh, so, I'm sorry. Again. So Steve Cook, 
who has worked with ceramics, bronze, site installation, and film. Um, he has been coming to Peters Valley for a number of years. I met him at Enseca, manning the table every year, which is the National Ceramics um, Convention. And um, he's just a very interesting fellow. He studied sculpture at Penn State and at Fu Ren University and National Taiwan University. For years, he lived in Asia, hosted a radio language show, edited ceramic papers, no, academic papers, uh, worked as a stump man, a shuttle boat operator, an adventure tour operator. He's worked in the Philippine film industry, which led him back to the United States, to the California Institute of Art for his MFA in film and video. And he uh, focused on experimental documentary installation. Steve, Steve's work has won awards at film festivals and was screened in the United States, Canada, Germany, and Italy. Since 1999, he's been devoted primarily to clay, teaching and aesthetics, and I would say with a, quite the inquisitive mind. So welcome, Steve. Thanks very much. Uh, my uh, uh, thanks go to Kristen, Lakota, and Bruce for inviting me to participate. I'm going to rehash all of those things that Kristen just said by uh, showing, um, oh, now it's changed on me. Okay. We'll get there. And we'll go to Excel and, and hope this works. Whoops, it didn't work. I've been thinking about the landscape of our lives and the meaning of creativity. So buckle up and we'll take a look at what being an artist has meant to me. Content is king and context is everything. At Penn State, I focused on figural work and filmic installations, spending a year abroad in Taipei. I spent five or six years in Asia studying Taoist philosophy and animism. I also worked in the action movie industry as a stuntman and animated prop with a bunch of crazy guys, including Richard Roundtree, Anthony Zerby, and Tom Skerritt. I had fun. At CalArts, they gave me a hat along with an MFA in experimental essayistic documentary installations including a portrait of a homeless schizophrenic surfer, my brother. Working in the film industry included a documentary in Ethiopia, as well as training Robert Patrick for Terminator 2, designing his character's movement and teaching him to run using a Taoist breathing technique. I taught art at a private high school for 20 years, designing curriculum, and was instrumental in the building of the gallery. I make mugs for a hip, cool coffee shop near Balboa Park in the San Diego Zoo run by an ex-student of mine, and he likes salt-fired stoneware. I tend to think of landscape and cosmology while I work. I like atmospheres of salt, soda, seaweed saggers. For me, figures bring a landscape meaning and context, and they interact with us. Figures allow me to think about our past and who we were. 
As a Zen Tao animist, I'm interested in our deeper states of being. Some of these figures became a stop motion animation exploring the id and our amygdala and efforts for transcendence. Well, I'm sorry, that doesn't seem to be sharing. I think we located. Can you hear me? Am I back? Yes, you're back. We never lost you. Did the video? Yeah, the video cut out, didn't it, for you? It did, but it's really interesting. Yeah, I'm sorry. Well, I'll tell you what, it's, uh, I'll list it on YouTube and people can check it out there. Yeah, it's really fabulous. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry, we we're almost done with it and it didn't, it didn't play well. So my apologies. That was an experiment and I was hoping PowerPoint would come through, but it yeah. didn't. PowerPoint's a little tricky with video sometimes. So oh. that happened to me during my dissertation. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, Kristen, but if anyone would like to watch that, it'll be on YouTube. And Lakota has the link. Fabulous. Okay. My apologies. No, that's okay. Um, because we, when we get the um maybe the link, we can post that. But thank you so much. That was fabulous. And hope to see you at Peters Valley next year in person. I can't wait. I can't wait. It'll be great. All right. Next, we have Kate Hawes. And Kate um, has been working with Wood for 25 years. She has worked as a custom furniture maker. She founded and run a cooperative wood shop in Brooklyn and had her own business making custom furniture for clients. She has a certificate in furniture and cabinet making from the North Bennett Street School and completed a residency at the Anderson Ranch Art Center. Her furniture has appeared in Fine Woodworking Magazine and Architectural Digest. She has taught at the Craft Student League, Makeville Studio, and the Folk Art Museum. She splits her time between teaching classes and working in her dream shop in the Catskills. And we were so happy to see her work last week in the Making Matters opening reception. So uh, nice to meet you virtually, Kate. Yeah, good to meet you guys. It's so fun to like kind of get to know everyone. I wish it was a little more intimate, but um, it's great. Thanks for organizing this. Um, you can hear me okay and everything? Yes. Yeah, okay, great. I'm gonna... Um, I'm just going to open by saying happy Juneteenth. Today is a, um, a special holiday, um, as you guys know, um, I'm sure, commemorating um, freedom of Black people in Galveston, Texas in 1865. Um, for me, I've been thinking about freedoms in my life and um, the different kinds of freedoms that I've um, both inherited and fought for. Um, but um, all of them very integral to this creative life that I've been able to lead. And so 
I feel very grateful for that. So just starting off, I'm gonna give you guys like a sort of beginning about me. And um, I started my journey. Can you guys see my screen here? Yeah, okay. So I'm screen sharing. Okay, great. So I started my journey learning a traditional trade of furniture making. Um, I went to a school that was very traditional in, North, uh, in Boston and they really drummed into our head like this sort of canon of American furniture. Um, the first piece we made was had like about a couple hundred or so dovetails in it. Um, which was really great training, um, but it's very, um, you know, very straightforward, very skills based. And then um, these are just some chairs that I made while I was a student. Um, uh, Chippendale on the left and Sheraton on the right. So it really was, I just wanted to give you an idea of where I come from in my, my uh, life as a um, craftsperson. Um, I went on to work for custom furniture makers and ran my own business making custom furniture. It's very precise, very exact, um, very meticulous. Um, <laughs> so then in 2008, I made this piece, which was my version of thinking outside the box. So I made a sphere with drawers in it. Um, I was thinking about a box that wasn't really a box. It's sort of barely functional. So I guess I've always been kind of interested in that borderline between furniture and sculpture and, you know, function and non-function. And like, when do you look at a piece and consider it, you know, sculpture or art versus functional? I feel in my work, tactility is really important. This piece really and I invites you to touch it. Um, so that is actually something that's very important to me is to not make art that's like at a distance, you know. Um, and then I, you know, I've in, I feel like I've always tried to sort of like experimented with wood in, 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 in different ways. This piece, um, I was just trying to work in a quicker and more sort of improvisational mode. So I just, this was um, eighth inch um, Italian poplar bending plywood that was just glued together with um, wire and epoxy. Um, but the result was this form that was like sort of a vessel that I painted very, a very hot color inside. So it sort of has this like emanating light on the inside. Um, so this is all a real departure from the work that I was doing um, in my day job. Um, this is a piece, I went to Anderson Ranch in um, 2009 and that was an incredible experience to be part of a craft and art community making work. Um, this piece for me was like a shift in scale to make something bigger than myself was really like an empowering experience and actually wish I did do more. I, I want to do more of it, but there's always the issue of space unless it's a commission. So, um, so yeah, it's kind of a, it's a, all these pieces are joined together. Um, lots of little pieces joined together. It's sort of feels like a vessel to me. Um, this is like in progress in the wood shop at Anderson Ranch. Um, but you can see that like, it really was, I do this thing where I just like to sort of build on to things. I like to kind of just not know where I'm going and just, you know, and usually woodworking's not like that. My training was not like that. We made full scale drawings of everything. It was, it was very uh, to the spec, you know? Um, so this was really fun. This is just a shot of me painting it. I wanted to show you like the scale. Um, it really was big for me. Um, this next piece is, was actually not big and it does go on the wall. Um, I'm always experimenting with things. This was um, marquetry, which is like laying up uh, wood veneer on a surface, a flat, usually a flat surface. 
And um, when you turn it at not, you know, at a different angle, in this case, the pieces are turned with the grain at 90 degrees to each other. Um, the light reflects it differently. I think the word for that is that there's actually a word for it. It's chatoyance. Um, so yeah, that created a pattern on this form that I made that was, is um, three circles um, joined together as a whole. Um, and it does come out of the wall. It comes off the wall. Um, oh, I realized, okay, I realized I wasn't full screen. It comes off the wall about four inches. Um, so it is like sort of between like 2D and 3D. This is a piece I made probably like three years ago. It's, um, I call it the pine line. Um, it's made out of pine, which um, I'm interested in materials to build with that are sometimes not like really the most showcasey fancy wood materials. So pine is obviously, a, you know, by furniture, furniture makers are real snobs and pine is, not the wood of choice for most furniture makers. Um, uh, but yeah, it suited my purpose. And um, I was really interested in drawing in space. So um, also working in a way in which I wouldn't know where this thing was possibly gonna go ahead of time. So really, I was just really literally drawing, trying to figure out if I could draw something physically in three dimensions. Um, so each piece is joined to the next piece, um, end grain to end grain, and then I would shape it down with hand tools. Um, so it's all done with hand tools. And there is actually joinery uh, between the two pieces just because you have to, as a woodworker, you have to make a joint, otherwise it won't hold. So there's actually like tenons and dowels in there. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so that was a really fun piece. Um, now we're shifting to my obsession with greenwood carving, which um, I've been in for the last couple of years. So I feel like my career as a woodworker is marked by these like shifts where I'm like, now I'm bored with this, I gotta do this. Uh, but I haven't left wood. Um, this is a workshop I ran at the American Folk Art Museum and I'm just showing this because I want, I feel like teaching and being in a community is really important to me as a maker. Um, sharing what I do, sharing my skills and my um, interest in wood, but um, also just passing things along and working with people. I'm sort of an introvert, so it really has been really fruitful for me as a person to teach. Um, and I feel like spoon carving is a really good way to do that. You can do it with very little in terms of shop and materials. Um, you're using an ax and a mallet and a knife. And you're really learning a lot about um, wood structure in that process. I think in a way I've learned more about wood in the process of working with green wood than I did ever working in cabinet shops uh, using um, lumber from the lumber yard. This is my, my dream shop in the Catskills. So I'm now upstate in uh, the Catskill Mountains and um, I get to work outside, I get to find wood. I'm really interested in finding wood from the local environment in the woods. Um, there's a lot of, every other guy you meet is an arborist. And so um, it's not that hard to get wood. Wood is in fact everywhere. So that's been kind of wonderful for me um, to get to know, you know, just to work with it in a different way. Um, this piece is a, um, actually there's a little video, yeah. This is a piece, it's a wall piece that, that for me, what's important, I don't know, I always look at the, like the wood, which the important part is that I, I lo absolutely loved this piece of oak that was like in the woods. It was like partly rotting. And um, I, I took the bark, the nasty stuff off the outside and there's this gorgeous, gorgeous like streaks of, of actually, I think uh, fungus. So it had like, it has like blues in it and yellows and like a pale green. 
So I was like, how can I use this piece of wood and just have it be about the wood? So I, I did put a drawer in it, but that's the furniture maker in me. I can't help myself. Um, and I did make it function, but I really wanted to show off the wood. Um, sometimes I see such beautiful wood, and I'm like, I, don't, I can't do anything to compete with this. Um, and there's a crack in it too, which is breaking another woodworker rule. Um, this is a, a carving I did of um, just like a doodle that um, I was sort of interested in. in um, okay, I'm gonna hurry up here. It, I was interested in like how when you draw like something really quickly, you're not like refining the line over and over again. And so I thought, well, what if I turned a doodle into a three-dimensional piece um, that was kind of finely executed um, without sort of tinkering with every single curve, making it perfect. This is a piece I did somewhat recently um, where I was exploring direct carving. So, you know, having a big chunk of wood and then literally diving into it and sort of excavating these forms that are embedded in it. In it. Um, so I sort of, I thought it was fun just to leave texture and um, it's really quite exciting once you get in there to sort of, it's like you're finding form. Um, this is just a, a small piece of maple um, that I carved an owl, inspired by the mountains up here, which are filled with owls. Um, this is like a really refined carving of a, of a, a bowl. Um, I got into bowls just as like a way to get into carving and sort of get my chops, you know. Um, so I'm really, this is pear wood from um, locally sourced a tree. Um, it's gorgeous wood to work with. It's just like closed grain, beautiful wood. Um, the growth rings are quite mesmerizing. Um, there's a lot of interesting things about bowls, um, you know, in terms of like convexity and concavity and also like there's like this sort of uh, parallel with the, the shape to the growth rings and the structure of the wood, which is also concentric, seeing as a tree grows with concentric growth rings. So the circle is always sort of with you, I feel. Um, this is just a carving, quick carving video. Um, it's long, that was to show that it's long laborious work. There's no shortcuts, um, <laughs> but an incredibly satisfying, incredibly satisfying. And um, I enjoyed the slow, slowness of it, I have to say. Another bowl. Uh, the bowl that's in the show, which I painted red, and uh, I decided it had to be a bird. Um, the other thing with carving wood that you find is that you have to work with all these limitations. Um, and sometimes your idea of what you want it to be changes. Actually, all the time it changes, and you have to let it be what it is. Um, this wanted to be a bird. Um, so here you can see like textured, it's a textured surface of tool marks. Um, so I had to get my tools super sharp for that. This is a bunch of things I've done recently. Every now and then just for fun to unwind, I carve spoons, like which I can do like in the kitchen or, you know, wherever. Um, I really enjoy utensils. I, I think there's a lot of interesting shapes that happen. Um, they're quite complex shapes, actually, even though they're small. This is apple. So this wood I'm in love with. It's apple from um, nearby, actually. A big tree came down in a storm. And um, it's just gorgeous wood. It's, it's, I, I completely adore it. It had to be a fish. You can see there's a little eye there. Um, not my doing. Um, <laughs> this is a... a it's, it's a form called a banza box, and um, it's a box where you take a big chunk of wood, bandsaw it apart, and glue it back up. I was just looking at, like, again, like, sort of, like, is something, it's a sculpture, but it's also got this hidden function that sort of keeps coming back in my work, I guess. Um, and this is just, impro this is right now in my shop. I've got all this birch 
and I'm car carving it into forms, not really knowing what it's going to end up being. So they're separate pieces. And I think I'll probably end up assembling them together somehow. Um, so really, I'm just exploring shapes and um, the carving practice itself, how to process the wood, how to be patient with the drying, when to carve, when to leave it, you know. Um, so yeah, I guess that's it. I wanted to, if I, can I have like two more minutes or am I at my time? You're a little bit over. Okay, okay, then that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kate. Yeah. Really beautiful stop. Thank you. Um, well, next, I'm going to introduce Lisa Westheimer. And unmute myself and start my video. Oh, I, I was. Um, She's giving you an intro. I was muted. I'm sorry. So Lisa. Let her introduce you. Okay, I keep getting muted. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I wanted to introduce Lisa, who's a full-time artist that's living and working in West Orange. She has a Master of Arts in Ceramics from Montclair State University. She teaches ceramics and glass at the Yard Art School and Montclair Art Museum. She's taught raku firing and glass fusing at Peters Valley. She is the author of Glass Fusing in a Clay Kiln that's available for sale at the Peters Valley Gallery and Amazon. And she has several instructional, D instructional DVDs on uh, raku with host horse hair and luster strike firing. Um, and She's been shown nationally, and um, many of her works are in private collections, but I want to say um, two things, so if you bear with me. Um, Lisa has an incredible, um, incredibly independent, unique um, aesthetic, and it's super, super technical. She is like a mad scientist. <laughs> all the glaze technicalities and firing and glass and has managed to fuse together glass which has lots of tricks to it and so does ceramics and has managed to figure it all out so you're like the mad scientist who also <laughs> puts out an incredibly deep spiritual practice into her work sending out good vibes into the world so lisa westheimer thank you Kristen. oh my god such high praise. <laughs> oh, um, thanks everybody for tuning in. I'm Lisa. This is the way my hair is supposed to look. And I'm so thrilled to be talking to you about my work tonight. I'm going to be talking to you about two ongoing series I have. I am an American of Polish and Italian descent. And the common thread between my two cultures is our Roman Catholic faith. So I tell my stories through um, sacred art. And I'm going to show you uh, two series. Um, this is my icon series. And it started with me having a collection of prayer cards that I've gotten over the years from family members and from my travels. And I decided to venerate them in icon format. This one is called Our Lady of Lords, and it's more representative of the Italian side of my culture. So what I did was, um, this is a, a fused glass decal fused onto glass of the front of the prayer card of Our Lady of Lords, and this is the back with the prayer on it. It's um, in a Raku fired stoneware frame where I threw some antique um, stained glass um, fragments onto it for luster. It's on a metal stand and the base is made out of a reclaimed wire glass window that cuts and just fuses and melts beautifully into beautiful stands. And this is a Murano glass slice. I got a, a kilo of them in Murano and I use them in my work. This one, represents the Polish side of my culture. This is Our Lady of Czestochowa, and she is a rock star, according to my Polish aunties, who we call Chuchis. And a lot of um, my family members have 
icons in their house of Our Lady of Chestahova, and a lot of them have amber in them. So I wanted to represent it on amber glass. And um, this is a very, very old prayer card. That, and um, I probably got it from my grandmother. And it's um, made out of the same materials as Our Lady of Lourdes. So for me, my art making is all about the journey. It's all about the idea, the execution, what the skills I need to learn along the way, and the people that interact with me in um, executing my pieces along the way. So I first started out with scanning these prayer cards and sending them off to a glaze company where the, they um, printed them out into uh, glass decals. And she said that I, it's $99 for however many images you could fit on a sheet. So I had them run the front and the back on two separate sheets of each prayer card. And I thought I would just use a few of them. Little did I know. Oh my God, I had so many failures along the way. But in those failures, I have discovery. Like this one. Now, I always tell my students that Clay is a dog, glass is a cat. Clay is faithful and true and usually does what it tells you, what you tell it to. Glass is like a cat. It will zing you whenever you're not looking. So this one came out too dark. And I just want to tell you, I used the same glass, the same decals off the same sheet, the same kiln, the same, even if I had several of them in one load, the same firing schedules and each one came out differently. And it took a lot to get where I needed to go. So this one is a reclaim. I made it into a 2D piece, which I was very happy with. This one, which is in the show in the gallery, is called St. Agatha Pray For Us. And St. Agatha is the patron saint of Naples, where my Italian family is from. And she's also the patron saint of breast cancer. And I'm a survivor of that. So I set about making this icon as practice to see how it would go for um, the rest of the pieces. So this is a Raku fired stoneware frame with Murano glass slices, a fused glass background. And this is a tin uh, Milagros of a pair of breasts. Now I purposely make the interior of the frame very busy because it can hide a, multiple, a, mul a multitude of sins. In particular, when the glass misfires, um, usually when it overfires, the edges round and sometimes they spread or sometimes they shrink, but at least this one worked out. So this one is in the Making Matter show. This one is also in the Making Matter show. This is an image of it in process. This is Our Lady of Lourdes. Um, this was like the fifth one to date. And it, the image came out okay, but first of all, it overfired and the glass spread so that I couldn't fit it in the frame, but also the toner washed out. So I made some more of these glass buttons. I glued on some miraculous metals and some metal filigree that I had in my studio. And it actually came out to be a really nice wall hung piece with the image on the front and the prayer on the back. You can see how much this spread in the kiln. Now take a look at the difference between this one and this one. And I'm just so pleased that this one came out as sharp as I needed it to. Now I thought I was done with this piece. I thought it would be a 2D piece and I decided it had to be a 3D piece. So I needed to research uh, metal workers to make me a metal stand. My husband says, oh, I just bought a MIG welter. And I said, well, you just better go use it and teach yourself how to make me a couple of stands. So there's Bill making the stands. And then there we have the result, which I'm very pleased with. So I have another series. It's an ongoing series called Ex Voto. I started it in 2012. In fact, I started it in a residency at Peters Valley in March, in the month of March. And um, it's a series of 13 urns that are gonna be made out of ceramic and glass. Within the urns are 12 
ex voto tokens that are heart shaped. And usually they're made out of tin and usually they represent either a prayer of thanksgiving or a prayer for something needed. And you leave them at the altar in Roman Catholic churches, especially in Rome. And um, so that God can take care of the problem because it's way beyond you. So I have come up with 13 ca uh, prayer categories that are universal to everyone that anyone would want or identify with. And I've set out to represent them in these urns. Um, this one is called Enough to Share and it um, deals with global abundance and scarcity issues and injustices and inequities and obesity and uh, food insecurity. I wanted it to be a happy piece. I wanted it to look edible. So I set about glazing these. Now on the back of each of these is the targeted prayer. Then I threw this, the stand and you have to do it upside down. You have to dry it, weight it down so that it doesn't warp or crack. And I had to be very careful about hydration percentages and shrinkage rates to make sure that I could um, make it big enough to go to Amazon and get a standard cake dome to put on it. So naturally my kiln overfired because it's also a cat and it, left me not only I couldn't um, buy one off of Amazon, but I also had very little wiggle room between the interior of the piece and the, the edge of the stand. So I called Glassroots Gallery in Newark, New Jersey, and I asked the glass blower to make me a dome. And I said it had to look like it's melting. He wasn't happy about that, but he came up with this and I really like this shape but this kind of horrified me. And I was like, can you make it look like ice cream, like Dairy Queen, please? Even Carvel would be okay, but make sure it looks like it's melting. And he came up with this and I was really pleased. This is it finished. Inside is um, a wireless color LED lighting system. Another one that I made last year is a loving family. And a loving family is um, representative of a passage in Revelation that says, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon at her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. And I wanted her to have all of the prayers for a loving family within her golden cloak. So um, I made her, but I couldn't fit all the tokens in, so I had to add this base to it. Inside is a lighting system, and this is iridescent fused glass that I um, fused using the cutouts in the um, piece. There she is, she's wheel thrown and altered. Those are the cutouts. Um, this Iraku fired her and of course it rained. Here she is coming out of the kiln. And uh, this is the latest one, A Sharp Mind. I'm running out of time. So I'm just gonna tell you, I just need to resolve this one piece here. Um, I tried to make it out of, ceramic by dipping this uh, tassels in um, clay, but it didn't work out. This is the first version, and this is gonna be the final version. Um, this is my book, Glass Fusing in a Clay Kiln. It's available in the store and on Amazon. And you could go to my website to see all those prayers, and you can follow me on Instagram and friend me on Facebook. Thanks for letting me go over, Kristen. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you, Lisa. That was great. Really great. Okay, last but not least, am I muted? I want to make sure I'm not muted this time. Okay, last but not least, we've got Rick Wright. And Rick Wright is an architectural and fine art photographer and has a studio in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He practices and teaches photography as a valuable And uh, though initially trained as a painter at Princeton and Columbia Universities, he later decided to study, excuse me, at ICP in New York. His photographic life is a blend of personal work, commercial work, and dedicated instruction. In 2019, Rick, Rick's fine artwork received critical acclaim and attention. He was published in Lenswork Magazine, Float Magazine, and Beta Magazine. Rick is collected in several permanent collections locally and nationally. Rick has kept the studio in Philadelphia for the past 13 years and teaches photography at various venues, including the Fleischer Art Memorial, Philadelphia Photo Arts, and the Halid Project. Um, 
Rick is also an extremely poetic fellow and truly a light whisperer when it comes to photography. So welcome. <laughs> Thanks, Kristen. <laughs> Everybody can hear me okay? Uh, all right, good, 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 good. A light whisper. Can I borrow that from my next uh, artist statement? That's lovely. Totally, you can. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that point, it's so nice to see everybody. And um, I put this image up for a reason. It's been used to promote, but it's Bevan's Church, of course. That's where we all are virtually sitting right now. So um, it's kind of a spiritual home uh, at Peters Valley. Uh, and it kicks off every great uh, artistic weekend uh, for all the instructors. So uh, it's nice to kind of bring some kind of tactility uh, back to the experience. Um, so thanks for having me, Kristen. Thank you, everyone. Uh, it's good to see all the familiar faces um, here at Peters. And uh, uh, I've enjoyed uh, very much watching everybody's presentation. And I, the thing that's coming across to me, and it helps me with my lecture, is the all the artists were talking about the malleability, tactility, uh, form coming from the experience of holding the material, uh, the wood, the wood in some ways dictating or suggesting directions it should go to be a fish. In the case of Kate, uh, Bruce's experience with architecture, especially those white pieces that were electrically uh, electric fried, um, not fried, fired. Maybe they feel like they're fried. Uh, maybe that's what I got. Um, but they're about form, uh, form dictating, transfiguration, all of those things. So I'm leading with that. It gives me a nice entree to my work because I'm looking for transfiguration also, but with a camera. Uh, it's the same experience. I always want to know uh, what else can the photograph be? What can it express? Uh, what is not apparent? Uh, what is paranormal? Uh, what is below the surface? What, is, what are the possibilities? Uh, so whether it's working physically with the material or working with a camera and lens work, um, you get those, get those same experience, experiences. When I am at Peters, I am teaching night photography. This is my crew from last year. A uh, lovely little group. Um, and we had two little people strap on and become uh, part of the crew as well. The ones without the red lights uh, were friends of the, uh, of the UART students. So we had an incredible time. This work here is not my piece. This is by Joe Sable. And at Peters Valley, this is available on the moonless nights. What you're seeing there is actually Jupiter in uh, not the moon because the moon wasn't out. Um, this is the, this is the uh, Milky Way galaxy and Joe as a student uh, did a brilliant job of capturing and collecting light. So, and this is very much to me, sculptural, visceral, tactile, all of those things that uh, you can get in other mediums. And also this one uh, by uh, Lanny Bass. Um, she made this lovely picture of uh, Bevan's church also with the, uh, that is the Milky Way going through there in black and white across the screen. Uh, again, with our friend Jupiter hovering on the, uh, hovering on the horizon. Very creepy, very eerie, very lovely. Uh, she was really happy with this as well. Um, Kristen, I hope to be on time, so please jump in since I'm the last. I don't want everybody to be too tortured with all the time we've taken. Uh, <laughs> and uh, this one I took in Wallpack, um, kind of has a Stephen King kind of quality to it. Um, so this is my photograph with the little, these are fireflies that are igniting. Um, and it was nice to see them back on campus, let's say. Uh, those beautiful little fireflies in the corners there. And this is an example of light painting, which is to say using a, a flash or a strobe to gel, you put a colored gel over it and you can light the trees even more green than they are or light things up as red or blue or white or whatever you want. In this case, this was an exit sign this was an exit sign that was inside the building that was doing all of the illumination and making it look like the, uh, the hell mouth to an alternate reality. Uh, so again, it's like letting the photograph and the light lead or dictate or suggest, should suggest a direction for a narrative. Uh, so I am so, so in concert with all the artists and uh, 
I'm, I'm glad to talk about photography in these ways. It's always, always been my favorite thing to talk about, uh, transformation. Um, the, this might be near and dear to your heart. This is right down at the center of Layton, uh, the offices and uh, <laughs> the four buildings, including the gallery building there in the background. Uh, a lot of paranormal effects, people walking around, lights, and of course the rush of the stars in the background. And this was a recent one I did, uh, Hoots and Hellmouth, uh, ironically enough, a band with the word Hellmouth right in the name. Uh, this is Hoots and Hellmouth. Um, you'll see that little pinwheel look that we get here because the North Star is actually in the photograph. And this is a sequence of about 90 minutes to two hours, I forget to get those, those uh, to get the stars to kind of like track across the sky and like scratch the surface of the lens, so to speak. It doesn't physically scratch the surface, but yes, that's the idea there. Uh, so that's what I do at Peters Valley. Here's a little bit of what I've done in the past, past few days, uh, well, past year. Uh, I also travel a lot. I love to have the experience of going to new places. This is Dea on the island of Mallorca off of the coast of Spain, the uh, south, I guess, east coast. Um, beautiful little island. I did a project for Float Magazine. Uh, I took over their Instagram account and did uh, 16 straight days, a new photo every day. Um, but uh, this, was, this is Instagram work, so I was using a phone, uh, quick action, um, some filtration, but just to put an edge on it, uh, not too much, this is really what the landscape looks like, these beautiful terraces um, and uh, beautiful quality of light uh, that abounds. So consider things like this, my fueling up stations. I try to make a trip at least once a year or every other year, uh, kind of for the visual, visual fuel I can get from it. And uh, this is a longer story than I have time for, but this was the Mediterranean uh, on the way out from Madrid, I'm sorry, from Barcelona to Dea, calm as a lake. On the return, they had one of their worst storms and literally 30 to 40 foot seas. Uh, so this is a massive ship, almost like a cruise ship size uh, with water coming over the deck on every, every sort of dive down into the ocean. Uh, terrifying, um, but lovely. When I'm not uh, adventuring uh, and fueling up on other images, other light from around the world. I'm behind this thing, which is a large format four by five camera. And that is me hiding uh, in there. That's my, that's the photograph by my nephew who really does not understand why anybody would torture themselves with the time and energy and all of the, all the setup. It's a half hour to set up a photograph. Uh, Meanwhile, he's taken 38 images and they're all published in New York Times. I'm still behind the camera trying to make an exposure, but uh, some things that come out of it are quite beautiful to me. I love shooting landscape and architecture. Over the last year or two or three, I've, I would say I've had a fusion. Um, that is the landscape looking like architectural, kind of having architectural qualities, uh, real formal qualities of, of a built environment. So I'm borrowing a little bit from my knowledge of architecture and shooting. And then in other cases, I'm trying to fuse landscape and architecture together. Um, so I'm beginning to see that in my work. Uh, this is a favorite recent where I accidentally solarized the negative. I exposed it to light while it was developing. Uh, so this beautiful ebony sculpture became almost silver-like. Uh, let me get that detail. There you go. You can really see she looks positively mercurial, uh, like she's out of, made out of liquid metal floating in space. Um, and my students hate the fact that that was accidental. They don't want to hear that. So um, that's, that's also the joy in material. Uh, photography is the same. It can surprise you like a firing uh, in, a wood, in a wood kiln or uh, the way wood opens up and has the stain in it. Uh, that Kate talked about, uh, the beautiful discoloration from uh, the fungus and all that. Similar, completely similar language. Um, recent favorite here in Independence Hall, uh, Philadelphia. Again, interactivity of the built and the organic uh, just fascinates me and always, always looking for transfiguration and morphing of space, uh, distortion, you know, paranormal, all of that, all of those words I really, I really am happy about. 
uh, here locally at the Zimmerman farm. Uh, one of my favorites I took uh, a couple years ago now, maybe it was a year ago. Uh, I think it was two years ago now. Um, again, that sort of interest in blending the landscape and the, and the, and the built environment. Endless information at the Zimmerman farm. Uh, this here is a quick project I did at Princeton uh, campus. This is Blair Arch. Uh, again, borrowing the spines of the interior of the building, uh, talking to the landscape behind, uh, literally uh, making this the portrait of this tree, but the interior of the spines, the sort of the buttressing, I guess, the support of the columns and all of that on the interior in the arch, having its relationship to the trunk and the branches. Uh, so I'm always looking for language, dialogue, parallel, synergy, uh, anything you can get um, out of the visible world and make it feel sculptural, um, have a physicality to it. So this is a fun little project. They're using them in uh, cards that they're sending out to alumni, but uh, I was really proud. This is an incredible day. I was one, one day shoot. Uh, I took seven, 10, about 10 images altogether. Um, Prospect Garden, beautiful little history there. I uh, just love all the interactivity of cop. This is a very coiffed garden, uh, you know, Renaissance style, French style, you know, like very formal, uh, but it completely relates to the, uh, the language of the building in the background. The stacking of forms at the hedges are very much like the stacking of the building forms in the background, as well as the sculpture itself in the water. And let's see, I have a few minutes left. So this is me uh, doing what I do every week in the Fleischer darkroom. And if I'm not traveling, not teaching, and not making four by five images, I'm in here, uh, either working on my own stuff, the darkroom um, and negatives, actual physical prints, or uh, working with students and helping them realize their vision. And in a lot of ways, it's what, what I'm saying is helping them understand how transformable the medium is. And I think when I talk about film and paper and working with chemistry, it is about the physicality of it. It's, I do work digitally, but I, the sensate pleasure, the real drive in my life and my work is um, working with actual film. Physical film you can hold and look at um, it has a quality to it. It's very singular. Um, one of my favorite portraits, people uh, think I don't take people f pictures, but here we go. Uh, the last four or five are going to be photographs of people. Um, this is maybe one of my favorite photographs I've ever taken. This is in my home, four of my dearest friends over for a party, but I, uh, I just love the complexity of this image. And most all those photographs in the background are mine on the wall. Uh, there might be an Edward Weston in there, um, uh, the pairs at the top, but uh, really, really lovely scene. Quickly, my parents uh, at a diner, but it looks like they're praying in church. Again, transformation. I don't know what happened. Uh, I love the light on my father's face and the, the ignition of an idea almost seems to be upon him. Uh, niece little detail out in uh, Colorado. I love little things like this in photographs. She had wounded her finger, so she was holding it tight, tight to stop stanch the blood. Uh, beautiful little ring with the universe on it. Uh, just the little details like that. And uh, you know what, I'm sorry, but like the plant over here in black and white silhouette is exactly like the white light forming on her shoulder. I forgot that part too, so. These are the things that drive me crazy. Um, this is out in Seattle, the turn of the new year, uh, down at the docks in Seattle, Washington. We got up there on a 36 hour train. Everybody should take it, LA to Seattle. And a couple more and we'll be done. Oh, there you are. Hi, Kristen. So, uh, am I near time or I have a minute? I can't hear you though. Oh, uh, you, you've got a little bit of time left. Oh, good. Okay. So, uh, just, I don't know one or two more to go. This is a couple I found at a part at a, at a public event looking like, I don't know, he looks like an Italian director or something, you know, I, I don't know if something came across there to me. And uh, I always end on one of Susan Stromquist, who's my dear fiance. We got, we got engaged over the last year. 
uh, here she is coming into a barn where one of my dear friends lives out in uh, near Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Um, really, really fond of this photo. It's a, it's a 15 inch by 15 inch print. Um, one of my favorite things I've done for the last year. So anyway, and thank you all, Peters. This has been amazing. So, and I conclude. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Well, thank you, Rick. And congratulations to you and Susan. That's thank such you. news. Um, and I just want to say in, in conclusion, um, thank you everyone um, to our amazing community that comes together um, to, for these lectures. I hope that they can inspire you while we're, we can't be together, but um, every week when the artist lectures take place, I'm, I'm always fascinated by the threads that come together. There's always some kind of um, theme that seems to emerge. Um, and I think it's, it's really interesting how we can all sort of bounce ideas off of all this wonderful work that we're seeing. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, I hope you will continue to join us on Friday nights. We also have um, some exhibitions, uh, an exhibition that opened up this week. Um, and we have two exhibitions going concurrently and uh, we'll be having um, some virtual openings and some panel discussions um, and there'll be more digital programming so we can stay together. Um, thank you everyone.